game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Fancy new opener, Bajo. That's right, Hex. New year, new look, and most importantly, new games. Yes, loads of new games to catch up on, including the doubly fine adventure Broken Age Act 1. Also this week, we explore the land of endless Nern with our first look at the Elder Scrolls Online. Plus, we round up a few quick reviews with Risk of Rain, Peggle 2, and Nidhogg. But before all that gaming goodness, can you guess this game? Last call for refreshments, folks. Go right this second to get something good to eat and drink to enjoy now or during the rest of the show. It's showtime, folks. Enjoy the show. Now, we played too many games over the break to talk about right now, but I think my personal favourite, besides a ritual replay of Dark Souls, was Risk of Rain. It's a retro-styled roguelike with a sci-fi theme. After crash landing on a planet, your goal is to fight your way through each level, searching for a teleporter to get to the next. Beasties will spawn and they'll get hard fast. The best way to describe this gameplay is a platformer with WoW-like abilities and a good rhythm to the combat. As you progress, you'll need to buy whatever power-ups you can find to get to the next level. Mmm, delicious meat nuggets. Stack them all. Death is permanent, but the more you play through, the better you get at the game and the further you get with each go. And the more characters you unlock. I just loved all the characters that you unlock, especially the cowboy. Pew pew. There's lots of nice little mechanics at work with Risk of Rain, especially how the difficulty scales with time. The tricky part is if you move on to the next stage without farming and stacking enough passive abilities, you might not make it through the next zone. So you're often trying to make choices about when to farm and when to move on, and then you've got that difficulty time limit on top. I just love how quickly things get stressful. <laughs> but when you have a good stack of destructive abilities, you just become this powerhouse of devastation. You'll definitely want to play with friends, though, and hook up a controller. It's pretty hard going on keyboard. In fact, this game is pretty hard in general. I do wish you could zoom in a little bit more, though, and it's a bit slow unlocking characters. Plus, connecting to a game is really fiddly. It's 7 out of 10 from me. I'm giving it 8. Another game that seriously grabbed hold of us over the break was the ever-seductive peg bouncing of Peggle 2. <laughs> This pachinko-inspired arcade sequel was released as an Xbox One exclusive, and it's had a pretty fun and flashy makeover. There are all new levels and peg boards that will see you employing some crafty strategies to get all the orange pegs cleared before your limited number of balls run out. Each stage has ten levels and is led by a different peggle master which offers you a unique power to help clear pegs in bulk when you manage to hit one of their coveted green pegs. Yeah, it's a great idea because it really changes how you play from level to level, because each power is so different. You know, I never really got into the first peggle, so I didn't think much of the sequel until I found myself sitting eyes glazed over at 2 in the morning completely hooked on this. Plus, one of peggle's smartest design features is still the music. The most triumphant moments from famous classical music pieces will burst from your TV whenever you hit that last peg, pretty much making you feel like an arcade god, regardless of your score. It's enough of an ego boost to send you happily buttoning through to the next board. I'm giving it eight. Yes, don't be deceived by this game's simple premise. It's easy to lose hours and hours in this rainbow madness. I'm giving it seven and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Now, last up, we have Nidhogg. This is another great game with a simple idea that packs in a surprising amount of depth. Ah! 
Nidhogg is the name of the dragon in Norse mythology that feeds on the corpses of the slain. This two-player side-scroller sees you, a pixelated yet expert swordsman, going head-to-head -head with another player in a duel for your life. The aim is to simply stab your opponent and then run like hell to the next area. Because every win gets you closer and closer to that end screen. Where if you win that final battle, you'll claim victory. Lose, however, and your opponent gets to run in the opposite direction towards their end screen. So it becomes a bit of a tug of war until one of you makes it to the end. The controls are simple, but if you're dexterous, you can get in some pretty tricky swordplay. You can move your sword up and down, for example, and if you time this just as your opponent strikes, you can disarm them. Add to this some scrolling platforms and deadly chasms, and you'll find yourself in some tense and exciting fights. The simplicity of this design makes it pretty hilarious to play, but you know, for a concept like this, you don't need all the extra bells and whistles. There are some nail-biting standoffs in this game, and I just love seeing those pixels explode everywhere once you or your opponent is defeated. Avast ye! Oh, oh, no. oh. oh, did you pick it up? Oh, wait! <laughs> Stop running away from me. <laughs> no. Oh! <laughs> ah. Yes! Go! Oh. oh, no! Oh, see ya. Oh, no, it's you! <laughs> <laughs> you love that throw. I don't love you? the throw. But it's uh, but I'm gonna, I've got to mix it up now. At the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make... I like how you can just leg it. <laughs> oh, kind of. Oh, one more battle. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Oh, oh, the final duel! Don't run past oh, me! Oh, yes. Turn and fight me, you coward! Oh, oh that was a coward's oh, victory! Oh, the victor gets eaten by the worm. <laughs> <laughs> You can play round after round because it moves at such a great pace. You know, I was surprised at how much time I lost to this. I'm giving it seven and a half. When you're playing against the AI, there is a wonderful increase in challenge as you take on each new level of difficulty. But you really should play this game with friends. And Hex, I laughed a lot playing this, but having said that, some more online options would have been nice and I did tire of it pretty quickly. So I'm giving it six out of 10 rubber chickens. Well, now it's time to catch up on some gaming news. With Goose? Thanks guys. Veteran game programmer and 3D engine designer John Carmack has left id Software, the studio he co-founded in 1991. Often credited for helping to create the first-person shooter genre with games like Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, Carmack will now focus on his new role as head of technology at virtual reality company Oculus VR. Famed deaf Japanese composer Mamoru Samuragochi, often referred to as Japan's Beethoven with credits on Resident Evil and Onimusha, has admitted to using a ghost composer. Part-time school music teacher Takashi Nagaki has come forward to reveal that he has been writing Samuragochi's work for the past 18 years. Nagaki, who received little payment for his compositions, alleges that Samuragochi isn't even deaf. It was the news that a figure skater was going to perform to one of his pieces at the Sochi Winter Games that prompted Nagaki to come forward. Nintendo has dramatically slashed its forecasted sales of the Wii U console after a worse-than-expected holiday performance. Company president Satoru Iwata has revealed the company is now expecting to sell 2.8 million Wii U consoles, down from its previous forecast of 9 million. The window is open. Need for Speed Rivals developer Ghost Games UK has reportedly been hit with significant layoffs, putting their unannounced next Need for Speed game on hold. Sources say that all contractors have been let go and that full-time staff have been given the option to leave or move to another electronic arts project. This follows news from EA that Criterion Games founders Alex Ward and Fiona Sperry have left their studio. Brad Lee, the CEO of long-running esports organisation World Cyber Games, has announced that it will cease operating any tournaments or events. In his email to partners, Lee wrote the decision to axe the 14-year-old institution was made after considering the current global trend as well as the business environment. And that's all the news. Back to you guys. 
guess he was all right. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> we often get to play games pre-release, such as a multiplayer beta, and first play is a chance for us to share with you those early impressions, keeping in mind that what we're playing isn't the final product and often changes upon release. Having said all that, we've been spending some time with the Elder Scrolls Online beta, and Hex, I think our expectations for this game are dangerously high. Yeah, but how exciting is it to see the continent of Tamriel finally stitched together in one game? The prophecies of the Elder Scrolls are a fluid living thing. They are not fixed. Scrolls are said well before the events of Skyrim and Morrowind, but I think we'll save talking about the story for our final review when the game's released. Yes, let's talk about what they're trying to achieve here. Taking a massively successful single-player series like Elder Scrolls to the MMO space is an interesting step for the franchise. Yeah, but a logical move, I think, because, you know, it's such a grand world with so much lore. Scrolls is a huge brand nowadays, especially after the success of Skyrim, so it already has an established following. Plus, it's coming out on next-gen consoles consoles too, which will really increase the player base. I think the big question about this game, which we can't really answer just yet, is will that single player design and gameplay of the Scrolls series transfer over to an MMO space? And will that be enough to warrant a subscription fee? We've played around 20 hours of the beta so far and tried out each of the very flexible four classes and explored the starting areas of the three factions. The first thing I noticed though, Hex, was I could not make my character ugly. In fact, everyone in this game is super sexy. Is that sea elf? I'll have to get this wound seen to that. Even the orcs are a bit sexy. It's like this is some kind of purist colony where only the beautiful people are allowed to breed. Oh, those roguish adventurers. You know, I think it's an MMO thing, because I always struggle to make good-looking characters in Skyrim and, and in Oblivion, but here, because I think a lot of people play this in third person, they're looking at themselves the whole time, you know, they want to be hot. I always make hotter versions of me. I, I want a good fat slider in every game. <laughs> Just, I like, I like making them funny, looking. This is never go back to that Mass Effect character that you created. <laughs> Creepy Shepard was amazing. <laughs> Nightmares about that. <laughs> Combat is a hybrid of Skyrim's action and more traditional MMO mechanics, based around abilities that you can switch in and out. Ranged combat works well, but the melee is a little clunky. <laughs> Yeah, I've never really enjoyed the melee in the Scrolls games. I've always felt it's been a bit, you know, like that. But yeah, casting is great fun, especially the destruction stuff. I like that there's a decent amount of freedom in terms of what kind of class you want to be. The more you use an ability or piece of gear, the better you get at it and the more you can unlock. This skill system worked really well on Skyrim, so I'm glad that's here too. And I love that you can play this in first or third person and they're both as good as each other. It's just nice seeing all the gear that you've worked hard for, which I think is essential in RPGs. We also liked that you can bring out a variety of instruments using emotes. We immediately started a band and uh, I think we rocked Bajo. <laughs> Yes, our band would play for anyone who would listen, and some of those who wouldn't. Sorry, sorry. Quick drums. Ah, oh, she left. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's chase her. Just chase her and just keep playing music around her. She's, she's getting away. <laughs> if we could line up so we have one in each ear. <laughs> it's especially tense in first person. <laughs> The simplicity of the aimed targeting makes combat nice and intuitive. It's near identical to what Neverwinter did last year. Mm. It just works so well. I think the days of tab targeting in MMOs are pretty much over, which is nice. I'm warming to the look of the game now that I'm seeing more of the areas, Hex, but I'm not sold on the visuals. It's, it's hard to describe why it doesn't gel with me, because there is a really nice high level of detail, but it's almost like the game doesn't have its own unique visual identity. Uh, personally, I do like that more realistic colour palette, though, similar to Skyrim. It just makes the fantasy feel more sophisticated than some of the cartoonier MMOs out there. But uh, I know what you mean, it doesn't quite have the wow factor of something like Guild Wars 2 with all those beautiful vistas. Yeah, I think it's a victim of the higher detailed you go in a game like this, the, the less of a unique look you can create. Weather effects do create some nice foggy ambience though, along with some really lovely sound design. I could stay here like this all day. You especially notice it when the game uses phasing to change the zones, much like WoW did in its last few expansions. This means the world changes around you as you take actions in the game, which in turn makes you feel like you're actually affecting the world. Yeah, that phasing technology is so sophisticated, I just love it. And it works so well with the scrolls' style of storytelling. It's not all pick up a quest, return to quest giver. Often they'll meet you at dungeon doors or go with you sometimes, and that all feels very fluid and polished. Show that friend here, we'll get us to safety. 
The quests themselves are nothing new though, it's really click this and collect that, and that is a little concerning to me. Also I find the quest givers tend to waffle on a bit. <laughs> yeah, it is always tempting when you're burning through quests to skip through the dialogue in an MMO. But I think with Elder Scrolls you really benefit from stopping and listening to the story and just letting yourself get into it and enjoy the adventure to get the most out of it. You know, if I had one wish it would be that they had adopted some of that player dialogue option stuff from Star Wars The Old Republic. I, I just loved that and this would have been the perfect game for it. When you put it that way I see your point. Yeah, I wish every game adopted that. I recently dipped my toes back into Old Republic and I've only just realised how important it is that you take part in those conversations and how much more connected you are to the story when you're actively involved in the dialogue or trying to be a jerk to the quest giver. I could agree. I did notice though, after around level 8, the quest tended to open up a bit more and give you more options in how you wanted to complete them and that's a really good thing so I hope that continues for the rest of the game. I can't stand to be in your company anymore. Sadly, our time with the beta is over for now, but it's already got us hooked into me a little bit, Hex, and I've got the MMO itch. Well, I guess we'll get back into it in April when the game is released, and we'll bring you our full review of Elder Scrolls Online then. The two first game that I really fell in love with was uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Whoa! This which was like a point-and-click adventure. I had a really old computer that was actually my dad's. Uh, black and white screen, uh, no sound, I couldn't do anything. But it, again, the story and uh, I think the essence of like be, being immersed in the game really shone through. Like the humor was really good in that game as well. And even though it was just text on screen, I was laughing out loud. That really gripped me. And after that, I, I just really got into shooters. I really got into that. But it's, it, it was that mix of like a good theme and, and humor and, and fun mechanics that really drew me into, uh, into games back then, which was uh, my starting point. You know, a lot of my discoveries seem like tall tales even to me. At least there's some evidence this time. Then again, maybe not. It's always a nerve-wracking experience seeing the fruits of a long-awaited crowd-funded project for the first time. Gamers invested their faith and money into Double Fine's latest adventure, Broken Age, and the result has been pleasantly rewarding. The game has been split into two halves, with Act 2 coming as a free update later in the year. I got it, but... From the moment that first screen popped up, I was just so taken in by this art style. It's just beautiful. It's almost annoyingly beautiful. Yeah, it's got that wonderful painterly quality to it, doesn't it? It gives the characters real personality. Yeah, and those colours are so vibrant. The first screen gives you the choice of embarking on one of two stories, though you quickly discover you can switch between the two narratives as you go, wondering if they'll ever intersect. Hey, rise and shine, son. I started on the adventure of Vela, who comes from a town of master bakers that must relinquish one person each year to a horrible monster. But then curiosity got the better of me and I flicked over to Shay, a lonely space adventurer stuck in a boring daily cycle, decidedly lacking in any sort of adventure. Take your time. Eating isn't a race. Both stories feel really different, but the protagonists share that common drive and resourcefulness that's required of a puzzle solver. Hey, what? What the? The dialogue is well delivered with a talented voice cast. Don't worry, I'll figure out how to get you out of there soon. Elijah Wood, Jennifer Hale. All missions are cancelled. Even some like Jack Black make their double fine return. Oh my, a fresh face rises from below. Both of these stories are charming and well written with tons of wacky humour and originality. It looks terrible on you. Might cost you the election. 
please, whom am I to trust? My highly paid stylist or a girl wearing half a dress? Gameplay-wise, the format is pretty straightforward, old-school point-and-click, though. I guess I was just hoping that with the uniqueness of the story and the art and it being double fine that they would, you know, come up with something a little bit more original, but this is still good. I guess the most important thing with these kind of games is that they're clear and well set out. What's that? <laughs> Nothing. So that there's no confusion and you're not stuffing around with inconsistencies of the design. And I think they've achieved a pretty good balance. Although often the actions you would need to complete will occur in what looks like a cinematic sequence. So those will play out a few times for me before I realised I needed to be moving the mouse around and clicking on things. Yeah, you just need to be constantly assessing your options. With each narrative, you'll be combining items to solve problems, but often the answer is quite simple, so it's worthwhile not overthinking it too much. Always try the most obvious solution first. One thing I did really like about these dual storylines, though, is that if I did get stuck or bored on a particular puzzle, then I could just flick over to the other story for a while and spend time in that world, freeing up my brain to tackle a different problem. The puzzles aren't too taxing, are they? Which may disappoint some. There are plenty of vocal cues if you do get stuck and unsure of where to go. It'll lead you in the right direction. There will always be war. We did not start it, and we cannot stop it. What we can do is protect the weak. But there's such wonderful storytelling going on that I think this is a case of the focus being on that wonderful adventure rather than really mind-bending puzzle challenges. And I loved how even at the start of these stories you could just feel this darkness underneath them. Yeah, I mean, it can be easy to get caught up in the loveliness of the art style, but you're essentially dealing with themes of human sacrifice. It's pretty full on. What are you doing down here? I'm an offering for the Maiden's Feast. You can't tell? There are also loads of little clues to that greater plot arc, as well as the more immediate puzzles you'll be dealing with in every conversation you have with the creatures and people around you. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to be taken there soon in Mog Chathra's stomach. It's just so well written. There was no conversation that I thought was boring or that I wanted to skip through. Yeah, and I love that you have your own purpose. But in order to achieve your goal, you need to work with and help loads of other characters along the way, creating those really lovely moments of interaction. Come here and help me! All in all, I think Double Fine delivered in spectacular fashion with this first act. There's a wonderful mix of simplicity in the style and execution of Broken Age, with what turns out to be quite sophisticated storytelling and consequence of action. You know, I had a few ideas about how this first act was going to pan out, but you're never really sure. No, no, nothing is what it seems. And every character you meet and every encounter is so weird and wonderful. This is beautiful work. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, it's such a creative and unusual world to explore, and there's a really cool ending that definitely leaves you wanting more. I adored this. I can't wait for Act 2. What I'm trying to tell you is that I made a hard choice, but I regret nothing because... Great story, computer. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 as well. Well, that's it for this week, but before we go, we simply have to mention a game which has taken over our office like a ravenous cyclone consuming everything in its path. Of course, I'm talking about Flappy Bird. Yes. <laughs> Come on! Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I haven't even yes. got one yet. Yes. It wasn't even close to that. Wow. It's a pretty simple concept, you just flap your wings to get in between the Mario pipes, but it's just it's really freaking hard. And you feel so stupid with every fail, and I see all these people with top scores of like 100 and something, and my top score is like 5. 5. Five's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's just because I have no rhythm, you know. I was never good at Guitar Hero. Right. Makes sense, it's just it's I, not my game. I hate this bird so much, sometimes I just let him flap straight to the ground. Not even, not even one pipe, just because I hate him, I want to watch him fail. <laughs> In a strange twist, the creator has actually taken this game off the store, simply stating, I can call Flappy Bird a success of mine, but it also ruins my simple life. So now I hate it. So for now, we'll just have to make do with the hundreds of clones that are already out there, including my personal favourite, Farty Bird. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did you guess the game for this week? Off. Bitch. It was the 2009 game Wet. You played as Ruby, a highly skilled problem solver, which is code for killing machine. With a heavy nod to 70s exploitation cinema, it had mixed success, but was a bit of fun run and gun and sword slash and stuff. And it's our guess the game because it features the voice of Malcolm McDowell, a well-known voice in the world of gaming, including this week's Elder Scrolls Online. Next week, we get our first big reboot of 2014 with Thief. We see 
see if Daisy can stand alone. For the Younger Gamers, Spawn Point returns this weekend on ABC3, and we're going to have a look at the brain bending hilariousness of Octodad. And don't forget, Good Game Pocket Edition will be neatly packaged and ready to ship on Saturday right here on ABC2 for the time crunched gamer. Until then, bar you out. Text out. Come to use this transitor shrine? A wise choice. What's going on there? You need a little help, buddy?